So welcome everybody to the next iteration of the IITE seminar series. So today we have a occasion where uh, we have two speakers, Matthew Spencer from University of Liverpool and Ned Wontner from University of Amsterdam. And it's going to be something that sounds crazy, but don't laugh yet, because it is about uh, axiomatic community ecology. Now I have to, I, I just have to share a story about this. So I think it was 2015, maybe when I got a paper to review, and it was by a certain Matthew Spencer, about measuring relative abundance change in communities. And when I got it to hand, I thought, what is there to discuss about relative abundance change in communities? And when I reviewed the paper, read through, I came away with, how come we never thought about all the depth that there is to measuring relative abundance change in communities? And it was, again, a very axiomatic approach. I highly recommend that paper. It's published. So uh, this is the place of advertisement. Uh, but with that, I should uh, shut up and let you speak, Matthew. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. So um, this is... Um joint work with Ned, who's a PhD candidate in the Institute for Logic, Language and Computation at the University of Amsterdam. Um, not only did Ned do all of the difficult technical parts of this, but the whole project wouldn't exist without him. Um, I'm going to give the presentation, but when it comes to questions, I'm mostly going to rely on Ned to, to answer anything that is difficult. Um, I hope he agrees with that. Um, so we're going to try to use an axiomatic approach to community ecology to address a question that has been around for um, more than 100 years now, which is whether there is more than one really distinct kind of ecosystem. And this is something that you can find in most ecology textbooks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of a kind of historical introduction. Um, then by way of background, I'm going to talk briefly about how axiomatic approaches have been useful in geometry. And then I'm going to sort of by analogy say how we could use them in ecology. Then I'm going to say a little bit about um, how we can, what are the valid ways to measure the properties of ecosystems. Then the kind of central thing that leads to our results is showing how we can put together ecosystems using axioms. And then finally, I hope, have an answer to the question of whether there is more than one type of ecosystem. So. Um, the two main proponents of this are, um, first of all, Frederick Clements, who is here um, doing field work with some of his assistants. And actually, one of the reasons I was still writing the slides for this talk after one o'clock um, this morning is because I spent far too much time looking at the um, University of Wyoming American Heritage Center photographs of Clements's fieldwork. Um, kind of quite an alarming number of transport accidents seem to be involved. But um, Clements really believed that there is a natural classification of plant communities into distinct types. Um, that was a very popular view, certainly in the early part of the 20th century. It's probably fair to say that. It's now a minority view, and the majority view, and championed by Henry Gleason here, is that when we try to classify communities into kinds, it's just us putting things into arbitrary categories as a convenient way to organize our knowledge, but not necessarily that represents any real underlying structure. And perhaps a, something that summarizes the way that many ecologists think about this now is this diagram of um, biomes or major kinds of ecosystem um, from Whitaker's well-known book, Community and Ecosystems. So we've got two axes here, of mean annual precipitation on the x-axis and 
mean annual temperature going kind of in the opposite direction on the y-axis. And Whitaker has divided this up into regions representing, for example, tropical rainforest over in the bottom right-hand corner. It's clear, though, from Whitaker's book that he doesn't think that this is really a natural classification of ecosystems. He thinks he's just drawing convenient lines as a way to organize knowledge. But if there really were distinct kinds of ecosystems, it would be a really important result. So what are we allowed to do in order to define types of ecosystems? And um, one of our central principles is that although we could give arbitrary definitions, like for example, we could say that we really mean, as on Whitaker's diagram, that if we've got mean annual precipitation greater than 250 centimeters and mean annual temperature greater than 20 degrees C, then we have something which we're going to call tropical rainforest, and we're going to claim that that is really a distinct category. But um, we think that that is cheating because it's a kind of arbitrary definition why 250 centimeters, not 249.9, for example. So what we really want to do is what um, Plato described as um, cutting up things where the natural joints are. In other words, we want to find out, are there any natural joints that genuinely separate distinct kinds of ecosystem? And it's not necessarily easy to do this. So a, a well-known example from Plato is the definition of a human as a featherless biped. So, you know, you could argue that, you know, there's no kind of continuum between things that are featherless bipeds and things that aren't. So if we've chosen our definition correctly, then we should be able to use this to determine what is a human and what isn't. So it's pretty easy to check the definition and show that it works. So here are two humans. Um, so although it's not necessarily straightforward to find definitions of categories, when, there, when genuine categories exist, we, we think we would be able to find some suitable definition. So next section of this talk, um, we're going to use a few examples from geometry where um, the axiomatic approach has been really successful. Um, first of all, in giving us results that are probably not obvious right away from a relatively small number of principles. Secondly, in helping us to organize our thinking. And thirdly, um, in the historical development of this approach. So um, Euclid's axioms are the, really the starting point for geometry. Um, there are five of them. I've said apparently self-evident. Um, some of them take a little bit more thought than others. And the, the word apparently is there for reasons that I think will become clearer later. And here's an example, one of the most important ones, what we call a parallel axiom, which is that um, for each straight line L and a point P that isn't on the line, there's exactly one line through P that doesn't meet L. And we often call that the, the parallel line through P. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the others, um, but the, the important thing that makes this approach successful is from just those five axioms and not all that much else, we can get quite a lot of results. I'm, I'm saying not all that much else because there are in fact some other things that um, are assumed which are not explicitly stated in the axioms. Um, but I, th I think one of the most interesting of these results is that there are only five convex regular polyhedra in R3. Um, and it's certainly not immediately obvious to me that that should be the case. It takes a, a little bit of thinking to understand why that should be. So 
here they are, they're called the platonic solids. Um, the way to show that there are only five, once you have all of the kind of geometric machinery that Euclid's axioms give us, is to think that for these things to be um, closed, we have to have at least um, three faces meeting at every vertex, like, for example, this one here. And that in order to be convex, um, the internal angles that, that these vertices make have to add up to less than two pi radians. And that limits the, the number of choices of what our faces could be, even though there's a countably infinite number of um, regular convex polygons that in principle we could have considered as faces. So just with those things, we can show that these are the only five things that meet our definition. And I think that's a, actually a really interesting result. But um, there were, for a long time, some kind of unresolved questions about Euclid's axioms. In particular, it was suspected for a long time that the parallel axiom um, might possibly be a theory instead of an axiom. Sorry, a theorem instead of an axiom. In other words, something that we could prove from the other four. And historically, the most well-developed attempts to show this were to say, supposing we um, take an alternative axiom, instead of exactly one, at least two lines through our point that don't meet the, the line not on the point. And the approach taken was take that instead of Euclid's parallel axiom and try to show that it leads to a contradiction. Well, all of those attempts to find a contradiction were in fact unsuccessful. Um, we get something that's different, but if we have this alternative axiom plus the other four from Euclid, we get something called hyperbolic geometry. Now, quite a lot of things carry over from Euclidean geometry. Quite a lot of other things are different. Um, it's often useful to think of it as geometry that's happening on surfaces with negative curvature, like, for example, saddle points. Um, um, it does have real world applications in particular. Um, if you're a marine biologist, you're probably quite used to seeing things um, shaped somewhat like this, which are um, somewhat like little pieces of the hyperbolic plane. And these ones, of course, are made from crochet. And there's a nice book called something like um, Crocheting Adventures in Hyperbolic Planes, which tells you how to make all of these things. Uh, so it came as quite a surprise at the time that we could, with an alternative set of axioms, construct something consistent but different from what everybody thought geometry was. So what about ecology? Can we do the same thing? Um, I think perhaps the evidence is that maybe we've not yet succeeded in doing the same thing as successfully, but there are indications that progress could be made. Um, a good starting point, I think, is Hutchinson, um, the book, An Introduction to Population Ecology. Um, on the first few pages, it has things that we can think of as axioms. Um, I think this book was actually written as an undergraduate textbook. Um, I can't imagine many undergraduate ecology modules for which it would really work well, but the, the first few pages actually are useful for undergraduates. Um, and the idea is it's really an exposition of um, things probably originating with Lotka, but presented perhaps in a somewhat um, easier way. So Hutchinson said, first of all, let's do this thing called the convention of continuity that uh, abundances are non-negative real numbers. So I've got x of t for um, x is the abundance, um, t is the time. And in addition, a thing called the postulate of parenthood, which says that um, every organism has to come from at least one organism of the same kind. So here we're thinking about systems that are biotically closed. We don't have um, immigration from outside. So what that means is that if at some time 
s, our abundance is zero, then at all future times, our abundance will stay as zero. And he also had the postulate of an upper limit, which says that there is some um, non-negative real number k, such that our abundance is going to be less than or equal to k for all times. Now, it doesn't look like all that much, um, but you can do um, at least something with just these things. Um, now, Hutchinson wasn't attempting to derive every kind of model that would um, satisfy these axioms. Um, I think what he was trying to do was show examples of models that would be permitted by these axioms. So if we have just the first two, continuity and parenthood, we can get the exponential growth model. Um, if we add the third axiom, the upper limit, we rule out exponential growth, but we can have logistic growth. Now, um, Hutchinson was kind of using stuff outside of these axioms to decide which models to look at, um, in particular, Taylor's theorem and Occam's razor. Um, the Taylor's theorem part, he probably could have got from um, an additional axiom, for example, something like um, the rate of change of abundance with respect to time is differentiable infinitely many times. Um, the Occam's razor part, um, I, I'm not sure that you could get that just from axioms. So um, I think these are a really good starting point. Um, they're probably not strong enough on their own to get us as far as we'd like to go. Probably a more, a more successful attempt in this direction um, came from probably one of the most serious mathematicians to do any work in ecology, um, Kolmogorov. This is Kolmogorov here. Um, I think he maybe wrote two ecological papers, um, of which the first one, actually very early, um, 1936, um, I think was stimulated by Kolmogorov reading um, Volterra's work on models for predator-prey systems. So Volterra was saying, let's write down a pair of equations describing the dynamics of a predator and a prey. And given those equations, let's establish what they can do. Kolmogorov was more interested in thinking, um, what forms could those equations take? And then given only that information, what can we establish? So, um, so he had a pair of differential equations like this. So N1 and N2 are our abundances. Um, and he said that they've got to take some form like this. So um, K1 of N1 and N2 times N1 for, for the first one, for example. Um, and he said that K1 and K2 have got to be continuous and have continuous first derivatives. Um, there, there are quite a lot of um, things that he just stated, it's got to be this way. Um, but the justification for this form here is um, really from having um, a closed system and thinking about the first term in a Taylor series um, having to be zero in that case. And he had, I think, eight axioms. Um, again, I'm not going to list them all. Here's an example. So um, this is for the prey, N1, um, the partial derivative of the function that tells us about um, proportional change in the prey population with respect to predator abundance is um, less than or equal to zero. So um, other things being equal, if the number of predators um, goes up, um, then the rate of increase of the prey population will decrease. Um, so just from these things, plus all of the standard stuff from real analysis, um, let's call McGraw show that only three different, only three qualitatively different things can happen. We can approach an equilibrium without oscillating, or we can approach an equilibrium with damped oscillations, or we can have sustained oscillations. Other things such as, for example, extinction are not possible. So um, 
that was a long time ago. Um, and perhaps in the intervening time, not all that much progress was made on axiomatic approaches. I think there has been more happening in the last um, couple of decades. First of all, it's a really nice textbook called Theory-Based Ecology. Um, I know that that's Pastor Atal. I know that um, some of the authors of that book um, sometimes attend these seminars. Um, I think the way I characterize this is um, the axioms that Hutchinson used, plus some additional stuff that relates to um, Darwinian evolution. So things like individual differences and um, stochasticity and who survives and genetic constraints that mean you can't you can't excel at everything at the same time. And I think most of the axiomatic theory, it's kind of more verbal than mathematical, but it's certainly a, a systematic attempt at deriving things from first principles. Um, another recent paper in PLOS Computational Biology, um, Antsman and Bollenbach, um, I thought this one was interesting because it was um, focusing on one particular property, which they call clone consistency. Um, so the argument here is that if we arbitrarily split a population into two parts, um, and those parts are not distinguished in any non-arbitrary way, then our model should behave in the same way as if we had aggregated instead of splitting. And they showed, for example, that this rules out some of the forms of model that are commonly used in microbial ecology, but permits others. And although we're not going to do the same as either of these two approaches, I think we're kind of trying to do some of the same things. So the theory-based ecology book is trying to um, get um, broader results that link up to other parts of ecology by adding additional axioms. And the clone consistent ecosystem models paper is trying to think of ways that we can build um, more complicated models from simpler models. We're gonna to try to do both of those things. So now we're gonna move on to how we can measure the properties of an ecosystem. In particular, we're gonna argue that continuous functions are the only sensible way to do this. Just a quick review of what we mean by a continuous function. So I've got um, pictures of three functions, f of x here, with um, x is the argument of this function. Now, this one here, it's a real valued continuous function. Um, we're going to use the kind of informal definition here that we can draw it without lifting the pen off the paper. In the technical stuff underpinning what we're going to do, um, we're going to use a more rigorous and more general definition of what we mean by continuity, but this is sufficient to understand what we're talking about. The second function here is not continuous. There's a, a break at this point. So we've got, we've got a sudden jump. So for example, this fill circle here indicates that um, this point is um, at, at this value of x, we get this, this value of f of x, not this one here. Um, but we, we have to lift our pen off the paper to draw this. This third one here, it is continuous, but it illustrates that continuous functions can be pretty complicated. So this one, for example, um, it's everywhere continuous, but it's nowhere differentiable. It's too jagged for that. So we're gonna be working with functions of this kind or this kind, but we're gonna disallow functions of this kind as measurements of ecosystem properties. The reason for doing that is that um, if we allow discontinuous functions, we're kind of building in um, arbitrary separation into types. And our the central technical fact that we need to know is um, shown on this slide here, and the image of a connected space under a continuous function is connected. So this is a kind of a simple version. Um, our connected space is just a subset of um, the real plane. Um, so this is quite a, a complicated set, um, but you can see that it's connected. So we can get from any green pixel to any other green pixel, 
without going outside the green into the white. And what I've done here is I've actually got a composition of two continuous functions, which again is continuous. So I've, first of all, I've measured the distance of each green pixel from the origin. And then I've applied my, um, I've used that as the argument to my everywhere continuous, but nowhere differentiable function. And this is the result that I get. And I've plotted the, the value of my function against the distance from the origin. The key result here is that even though this is really complicated, um, that the image, all of the points that we map to from this connected space, um, they form an interval of the real line. Now, um, intervals are the only um, connected sets on the real line um, in the, the standard way of thinking about the real line. Um, and this remains true for more complicated sets as well of the kinds that we're going to be looking at later. So we're going to, we're going to use this kind of key technical result um, to get to our conclusion. But what we're going to do now is look at how we can how we can put together ecosystems from axioms. And there's four things that we're going to need for this. Um, so we've got a set of natural numbers that we're kind of labeling our species with these. So we're not allowed repeats. Each species is distinct. Um, and we've got a, a, a matrix G, which is the size of S by the size of X. And it, I'm calling it a matrix, but the elements of this matrix are functions, and they're infinitely differentiable functions um, that tell us about the, the so GNM tells us about the effect of species M on the proportional population growth rate of species N. Third thing we need, um, P, um, for um, each pair of species, we it basically tells us um, one of three possibilities, either um, N eats M, in which case we'll give this a value one, or if N doesn't eat M, we give it a value of zero, or if N is a producer, we label it just as producer. And we have another um, matrix size of S by size of S, which we call C, that tells us um, how we, and, and again, the entries of this matrix are infinitely differentiable functions that tell us um, for, um, for biomass of M consumed by N, how do we turn it into um, M? And that, that's, that, that conversion is gonna be inefficient, but, um, we're not putting strong constraints on exactly how this can happen. And then with those things, um, we're going to define a class of ecosystems. Um, so the first thing we need is what we call a dynamic assignment function, um, psi. Um, so this maps um, N2, the kind of Cartesian product of two sets of the natural numbers, to two by two versions of our um, matrices of um, effects on proportional population growth rates and of classifications into um, predator, not predator, or producer, and our um, functions that tell us about conversion. Um, and this is where our axioms come in. We've, we've got to satisfy all of these things. So, um, we have assumed that um, predation has positive effects on proportional population growth rate of predators, negative effects on proportional population growth rate of prey. Um, producers can increase when rare. Um, and we're not allowing um, mutualism in the version of these axioms we're using at the moment. We, we can only have either predation or we can have production by things that, that can increase when rare. Um, if you're not a producer, you have to have some prey. Um, if you don't have any prey, then your proportional population growth rate will be negative if you're growing alone. And producers are self-limiting. This is like um, Hutchinson's um, postulate of an upper limit. Um, monotonicity. Um, so um, 
if we've got a pair of a predator and a prey, if we increase the number of prey, we increase the proportional population growth rate of predators. And if we increase the number of predators, we decrease the proportional population growth rate of prey. And conversion is inefficient. We get less predator biomass out than we put prey biomass in. So these axioms are not um, the same as Kolmogorov's axioms, but they're kind of in the same spirit. Um, and we, we kind of picked Kolmogorov as a starting point because it seemed promising that he got so much out of a relatively small number of axioms. Now, this, this next part that is a little bit like what Anseman and Bollenbach were doing is finding ways to make new ecosystems from old ones. So we start with what we call basic ecosystems that have just two species. And then from those basic two species ecosystems, we generate what we call the class of G ecosystems by a set of basic operations. So we can, we can just kind of permute the indices of our species or we can remove a species, we just cut it out. Or probably the most important one, we can glue together the matrices representing interactions so that we get an ecosystem containing more species. Now the gluing part, it just kind of intuitively, it just means making sure our labels match up. So the description of exactly how we do the labeling is a little bit complicated, but intuitively it's a simple concept. And we can change the rate at which everything happens in our ecosystem by applying a scalar multiplication to all of our um, interaction effects. And these are what we call generative axioms. So we're starting with simple ecosystems and building up um, complicated ones. We can show that there's a corresponding set of limitative axioms, which we we will end up with the same set of ecosystems, whether we start in a generative way or a limitative way. I focused on the generative ones here because they are more useful for what we're going to do next. And um, something that I hope will look a little bit familiar um, is how we get abundances of our species from these axioms. So supposing we've got an, a G ecosystem E, so that's a set of labels, a set of functions telling us about um, interactions, a set of labels that tell us who is a producer and who is a predator and what they feed on, and a set of functions telling us about conversion, then we get what we call a Kolmogorov equation. It's the rate of change of XSN is XSN times these three terms in the brackets. So we've got self-effects here, um, summation of over all of the things that you eat, um, how much we convert of what we consumed of each of our prey species. And this third term is all of the things that are eating you. So this is kind of just like a sort of, a, somewhat like a generalized version of what you might see in say, Block of Volterra. Now, the, the really important part is what kind of structure is there on the set of ecosystems generated in this way? So let's call D our set of dynamic assignment functions, which we can think of as maps from um, Cartesian product of the natural numbers with itself to, um, to our kind of two by two ecosystems. And that E be the set of ecosystems that we generate in this way. Now, first point, um, we can build a metric space on D um, using, I mean, with D, we're working with things like um, infinitely differentiable functions. So we can use things like um, uh, a one metric or a two metric or an infinity metric to tell us how different two functions are. So we've got a concept of um, how close we are in D. And then because um, we're, we're effectively building um, our set of ecosystems E from our set of dynamic assignment functions D. So there's a kind of space with corresponding structure on E. So once we've got that... Matthew, um, sorry, sorry, you lost me on the calligraphic D. Can you explain this again? What, what is this? Um, why don't I... Ned, could you step in at this point to give a better definition? 
Sure. Um, so the, the dynamic assignment functions are they have all of the information about all of the little two by two ecosystems. So that calligraphic D is the set of these, um, these complete lists of information. So you've got lots of different ways the complete lists of information could be. And then we can put a distance, a, a metric on these complete lists of information. So even though the ecosystems might only have two species, for example, the, the dynamic assignment function says behind this 2D ecosystem is actually a, a complete list of what a, uh, you know, what a 70 species ecosystem or a, a thousand species ecosystem would look like. Is that clearer? A bit clearer. So one of the ways that we were talking about this afternoon that I found helpful for thinking about this is that um, we can think of a sequence as a map from the natural numbers to the real numbers. So for each natural number, we've got a corresponding um, term in the sequence that is a real number. Um, what we're doing here is we're mapping um, from N2, the Cartesian product of the natural numbers with itself to something a little bit more complicated, but in a way it's a bit like a sequence. So what, once we've got the structure on D, we've got a corresponding structure on E because we're really kind of building E from D. And then our key result, um, I mean, I'm calling it a, a pseudo metric space because the distance-like thing that we get on E is not, it's not quite a metric. And our key result is that the corresponding pseudo topology, we get something with a structure in which we've got a notion of closeness on our set of ecosystems is connected. So like my, um, my complicated set, the kind of outline of a squid, we can get from um, every part of it to every other part of it. Now, once we know that, um, uh, the result again from the squid diagram, the image of the set of ecosystems under a continuous function is connected. And we've argued that the only kinds of sensible measurements of properties of ecosystems are continuous functions. So consequence, um, because continuous functions and map connected spaces to connected spaces, um, any measurement will give us just one kind of ecosystem instead of many kinds. So that's really our key result. So just a restatement of the argument that our sensible measurements are continuous functions. So we're saying that it's cheating to pre-categorize in partitions like saying the size of our ecosystem is small if total biomass is less than 100 and large otherwise, because we've got no a priori reason to pick Hundred rather than one hundred and one or ninety nine point nine or something. I mean, these may be um, kind of useful as sort of rough classifications, which I think is what, for example, Whitaker was doing. But they are not real distinct things. So we claim that everything we are allowed is some kind of continuous function. But there are quite a lot of kinds of continuous function that we could have. So, for example. Differences are now functions representing interactions. That's our, our big matrix G of um, infinitely differentiable functions. And so differences in those functions, um, which we can measure using methods from functional analysis, tell us about differences in the, the dynamics that are kind of encoded in our ecosystem. Um, things that I've called kind of loosely weighted sums of abundances. Um, now, what people call ecosystem function, very often they measure it by saying each unit of species I does this much of the thing we're interested in, like, say, fixing carbon or cycling nitrogen or something. So then we multiply the abundance of that species by how much of the thing it does and add that up over all species. That's a simple kind of weighted sum. It's probably a bit slightly inaccurate to call diversity indices weighted sums. They're, they are a bit more complicated than that, we, but we're basically um, adding up kind of functions of abundances over all of our species. 
And those are, in most cases, continuous functions too. Something a little bit less obvious and um, graph edit distance. So, for example, between measuring differences in interaction networks. Um, now, typically, a graph edit distance, like a number of operations you have to do to turn one graph into another, um, is going to be in natural numbers, not real numbers. But we can put a suitable topology on the natural numbers to get um, something which we, meets our definition of a continuous function. Um, other things as well, which which will we're claiming will always be some kind of continuous function if they make sense. So just to sum up, um, by an axiomatic approach, we mean something that is internally relatively consistent. Now, relatively consistent means given other kind of underlying stuff, um, using principles in our axioms and as far as possible, nothing else. Um, that approach has been very successful in geometry. Um, in ecology, we haven't seen as much being done. We, we probably don't yet have strong enough axioms to get really exciting new stuff. But I think there are encouraging signs from, from a number of interesting pieces of work that have been done in recent years, plus some much older stuff, that this could be possible. Um, for what we were trying to do, um, with the axioms we used, we only get one natural type of ecosystem. So that says Gleason, not Clements. On the other hand, we could probably, with slightly different sets of axioms, like, for example, um, the axioms underlying the analogous to what underlies hyperbolic geometry instead of Euclidean geometry, we could probably have got more than one type of ecosystem, certainly in relatively obvious ways, like, for example, if we only allowed either competition or mutualism, but not both, we think our ecosystems would just fall into two separate kinds. But if we really believe that there's more than one interesting type of ecosystem, in other words, not these kind of obvious things, then we probably need some other axioms. Um, there are some perhaps obvious ideas about what those other axioms might be, but I will leave you to think about which of them might make sense. So thank you very much for listening and we'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Matthew and Ned. And uh, if you have any questions, as usual, just raise your hand in the uh, chat and I will call on you. while people are thinking I can have questions. Uh, so one thing I was thinking of is uh, what should we even mean? And this is more biologically. And I mean, how do we map that onto the theory that you were just presenting mean with different types of ecosystems? So, so one very classic example people like to bring up are critical transitions, say between a forest and a savanna state. I'm sure a continuous mapping ex exists between the two, of course it does, but most ecologists might argue, well, that's not the point. The point is that it's very difficult to get the in-between states. We only see one or the other under robust conditions, at least, and that's what we really want to mean by having multiple kinds of ecosystems. Is, do you agree with that view or or, or not? Is that compatible with, with what you're doing? Um. I, I'm not sure what Ned thinks about this. Um, my own opinion is that um, perhaps if we think that those things are really distinct types, which you know, it's kind of a perhaps a reasonable view, um, then if we want to support that view, we need to add some other axiom that, that says what it is that makes those things different. Um, now, the thing that I have in the back of my mind here is that perhaps it needs to be something related to stability. So, for example, what, what we're really saying is that um, between any two ecosystems, no matter how similar they are, we can, we can put another ecosystem. Um, I think that what... 
what we're wanting to argue if we say that um, forest and savanna are distinct is that there is a gap that where even though our axioms allow that ecosystem, um, in reality, that ecosystem is not a possible one. So um, stability is perhaps the place that we should be looking. Um, I don't know what Ned thinks about that. Yeah, I, I mean, I largely agree. One, one thing we would have to block is the gap having a, um, a sharp edge, because if the gap has the sharp edge, we just get the same problem again. So you've got to either have you've got to have some kind of blurring you can't you can't say here we're at savanna and then there's a sharp edge and we're at the in unstable gap because then you've just categorized again so you've, you've got to have at some stage you've got to say okay this this is the level at which there's blurring uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry I'm, I'm not sure i follow that last one. So, so let me explain where I'm coming from. Maybe it's the same thing is that uh, I think what Matthew said is is, is close to that, that uh, there are systems that are bistable. So you have three equilibria. One of them is unstable in the middle and two are stable on, on the sides. And, and say we can imagine forest and savanna like, like that. Let's just assume for the sake of example that we can. So in that case, we know that all the ecosystems in between do exist. It's just that can we... I'm wondering if it's a question of axioms or more definitions or of sort of associating ecosystems with the stable states and their immediate surroundings somehow. Is, is that even a feasible project within this framework to, to do? Uh, it, sounds, it sounds like the thing that's happening there is that the stability becomes a, 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 a way of categorizing. Yes. So that the exactly. types of the types become the stability, exactly. um, but of course, stability isn't a measurement. So st st stability is is sort of like a um, you know it's a it's a pigeonhole boxing thing rather than we, it, there's there's well I'm not sure here I would have to defer to my ecological colleagues to say is is there a measurement that you can say about about stability or is it more a kind of um, uh, a property that develops from the mathematical behavior of a system. If if there's no measurement, then what you're talking about is kind of like what we were saying at the beginning. It's it sort of becomes a pre-classification. We're just going to say that there are these things stable systems, and that's no longer a no longer something that you measure about a system. Okay. Thanks. I'm just one wonder, you know, I don't know where you are in this project. I'm just wondering if it's worth considering the, mm, the perspective yeah, that yeah, yeah. I assume I'm not an ecosystem ecologist or someone moving there. So I have no stakes in, in this debate. I'm just wondering if, if uh, there are ecologists who would naturally take this sort of stability based pigeonholing approach or whatever you would, you would call it as, as the natural way to do mm. ecosystems. Just a thought. Uh, but anyway, I, I think thank you so much for, for, for that clarification. And uh, Nadav's hand is up, so please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, following uh, your question, you define, if I understood you correctly, you define uh, the, the system which is connected is, is um, all the ecological models, not all the, I mean, what is, Continuous in your theory, the models there, there are mo the model all the model parameters are continuous and all the it's not the result of the model, namely the abundances of species. Or, or, or am I wrong? Um, I think I'll I will try to answer first, and then I'll let, let Ned tell me if I've got it right or wrong. Um, I think that we are, I mean, we're kind of looking at continuity in the, the structure that determines what, what dynamics are possible. And then things like abundances are generated from that structure. Ned, do you think that's a reasonable way of thinking about it? Yeah, so, so, the, so there are the continuous, continuous functions are used in two places. Yeah. So the, the first place is the all of the kind of internal information to an ecosystem is a continuous function so the abundances 
the proportional growth rates, those are all continuous. And then in, a, in addition to that, we're thinking about um, kind of ways of comparing two ecosystems where an ecosystem we take to have built in lots of continuous functions. Yeah, but for you, what defines what defines the ecosystem is a set of parameters, say, of a certain set of differential equations. And all these ecosystems are sort of uh, connected to each other in some space of possible models. Mm -hmm. but but there is an, another question, which is what, is what are the set of abundances that emerge from your model? Yeah, so with a minor elaboration of the um, axioms that we currently have, you can include the solutions to, to the differential equations which have the abundances. And, uh, and then you can uh, kind of run the same sort of argument going, Okay, now we want to compare these solutions to the equations and put a space on the solutions to the equations. So the solutions are also connected? Uh, yes. There's a small question about whether they're the combination of the ecosystem, i.e. The, the, the differential equations, and the solutions to them combined. If you, if you combine both of those pieces of information, do you still get a connected space? Uh, we conjecture yes, but we don't have a full proof of that. Okay. But e the, even so, if you just looked at the abundances and you, you made a topology on those abundances, which you can do, you get the same result, which is that the abundances form a connected space. So continuous image of the connected space is connected. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, Xin Yi, yeah, go ahead, please. I think, I think, I, I'm sorry, I think Axel actually uh, raised a hand before me, so I'm happy to go after. Just, uh, uh, Axel, please go ahead. <laughs> then. Thank you very much, Xin Yi. Um, okay, two, two, two similarly kind of uh, probing questions. If I have a species that goes extinct, is this, or no species that goes extinct in my ecosystem, is this a distinction I am allowed, is, is this a distinction in your sense or not? And I believe it, it could be, but you, you have constructed your models so that case is excluded. I think in your case, you cannot get extinctions maybe. And, and the second question is, if I get oscillatory dynamics or not oscillatory dynamics, isn't this a kind of a nice way to distinguish types of ecosystems? So we definitely don't exclude extinction. Uh, that's it. Um, but can they happen? Did you, you, do a, you model this thing and do you see this happen? Extinction? We yes. have not, well, we haven't built any models of this kind and like done numerical experiments. With them. It's all done as kind of analysis and topology. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a big old space of possible ecosystems rather than particular ones that we've um, kind of calculated. Uh, but the oscillation, the oscillations, okay. I believe the oscillations will be similar to the stability question in that oscillations will be a categorization, um, but they're not really something you can measure. Um, I would have thought probably we can measure them because, I mean, I mean you can imagine doing, you know, things like, for example, local stability analysis mm -hmm. around an equilibrium and things like you know, eigenvalues, they are a thing you can measure, right? Um, so I think you know, potentially they do fall into our category of things that were allowed mm -hmm. and that they are continuous functions, right? Yeah, yeah. If you think about oscillations in that way, I guess what you have is kind of a spectrum of how how oscillatory uh, an ecosystem is, and then you would end up with, I guess, thinking on my feet, um, all of the possible intermediate strengths of the oscillations. So again, you would end up with a connected space of ecosystems mm. going okay. from not oscillating at all and to 
it's waiting a lot. So I think maybe um, you know where things do get more interesting though is that if we say, for example, something like you know, dynamics really are qualitatively different if the um, largest real part of an eigenvalue has one sign versus another sign or something like that. That's not an arbitrary choice, is it? No, it really does make a difference if it's like, you no, know, one times 10 to the minus six either side of it. So perhaps- yeah, Can, can I actually I jump in here? So that might be an example of a discontinuity because um, as your eigenvalue crosses zero, uh, the, the, the center of the complex plane, you cross a point where invertibility is lost. So, for example, if if we're switching, some sort of state switch happens, but otherwise we have stable states, then suddenly the matrix is not invertible. Suddenly we cannot express the abundances. Uh, I'm not sure what the implications of that are for what you're thinking about. I'm just mentioning that as, as something mm, to me. I think that that's a really good point. That's a good thought. Yeah, thank you. We will give some more thought to that. Thanks. Uh, sorry, Axel, did you want to finish something? No, I think I, that's, that I should, shouldn't continue. I could continue. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Axel. Yeah, uh, Shinji, it's your turn now. Thank you for your patience. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the very, very thought provoking talk. Um, but I'm wondering, so I actually have one um, a basic clarifying question and uh, one question following that. The clarifying question is that if I understand correctly, basically uh, to describe the, eco uh, the ecosystem as a continuous function, basically the parameter we usually use, uh, or like your, like at least I think for the example that you gave in the slides, are usually sort of some inter like some uh, par parameter that describes the interactions or uh, energy flows in the system or the outcome of those, which can be the population abundance, um, as you just mentioned. Uh, so, so this is so. Is that correct? So that's a clarifying question. And following that is, uh, if based on my uh, based on that understanding, it seems that those type of parameters, especially those uh, based on describing interactions, can be pretty challenging to measure in reality. So I wonder what's the end goal of having this axiomatic one ecosystem do we want to uh, is a goal to be like is is a goal to parameterizing them so that we can like compare across ecosystems or relate uh, the different types of or like the different spectrum of ecosystem to other type of uh, ecological questions or if it's actually like very challenging or it's really not a goal to parameterize such thing uh, or measure measure where a particular ecosystem lies, then what can we utilize this? So I think that the first part, the clarification part, I think, yes, what you were saying is correct. Now, it was, um, I think, four prime ministers ago when we made our notes on what we thought we might do next, possibly three prime ministers ago. Um, so let me just have a quick look at some of the things that we thought we might That do. was like yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, some of the things, that, well, here's, here's one example. So um, supposing we've got something that um, measures how different our dynamics are, you know, some kind of a um, something like say a pseudometric on the dynamic assignment functions. And an obvious thing is, for example, to get data from say the International Biological Program or from one of those other big collections of um, of ecosystem models and ask whether there are systematic differences between, say, um, less disturbed and more disturbed um, ecosystems. Um, and for example, um, we've also got um, 
data from real systems in which we've done experiments and we want to know um, whether different forms of model for the same system fall into distinct types or not. I mean, we're, I think it's fair to say we're still a bit uncertain about where this will go because um, we don't even have notes written up in a form that we could give to anyone else. I mean, last time I tried to read them, I couldn't remember half of what our notation was. Um, but yeah, but it's exciting to to hear that you guys are sort of are already looking into into data. Sorry, no. Just to add one small thing. I mean, the, what's nice about this is that if we can um, make some reasonable kind of simplifications or reasonable guesses about what the required actual parameters would be for particular real world ecosystems. We then do have all kinds of measurements for how different those ecosystems are dynamically. And we we don't have that many ways of measuring the, the differences in the dynamics of ecosystems. So you know if if we can get past the kind of data to model gap which is hard then we do have quite a lot of tools within this framework cool. that's exciting thank you thanks so much uh, one second in the chat there was a question from don who says, what does it mean that you have allowed yourself the, the falsely convenient pigeonholed categories of species? Does dropping that assumption make single ecosystem result even easier? Um, species are kind of, you can kind of view species as dimensions. Um, so that means that sort of the categorization by species doesn't end up causing any downstream classifications. Um, I'm not sure if that's a useful way of thinking about it. You know, think about like if, if we have at the line and then we have the plane, just because we've now got two dimensions doesn't mean we've got two categories um, for classifying things in the plane. That's, that's the sort of thing. Um, possibly one other way to think about this, um, I think it's a really good point, actually, that species are probably not real things. Um, the kind of organism that you work on probably influences um, how much you think species are real. Um, but um, I can imagine going from, for example, instead of a finite number of categories of things that we're calling species, supposing we have a you know, a countably infinite number. Um, does anything much change? And I think the answer is probably not. Yeah, our setup certainly is kind of fairly inclusive about having countably many species. I don't know, Don, if you wanted to reflect on that or not. Well, I, yeah. I was not thinking that it caused um, potential categories to jump out, but it just made, it was the opposite, right? If you can get to anything that you're calling a species to, from any other species, as if, if, if that's a continuous space, which as we just think about these in terms of bundles of traits or something, um, then uh, it, it seems like uh, just following that, it, the argument for a single ecosystem that you can walk around in this space from one ecosystem to another without ever having to jump over any gaps is, is even easier to arrive to, but that's just a, a, a gut feeling. Um, so yeah, I wasn't thinking it would, it would refute the idea of single e ecosystem. I, I was thinking it would make it, it'd make it easier. Hmm. Um, I'm honestly not sure if I know the answer. Um, whether you think of a species as just a bundle of traits or not, I think depends on. Oh, plus plus time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ultimately, you know, the 
if you think that what defines your species is, say, a DNA or RNA sequence, I mean, that is kind of discrete, right? Um, but I don't think I'm going to venture anything that looks like a definite opinion about this because I, I genuinely don't know what I think the right answer is. Um, yeah, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Joelt, please go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, you know each other uh, because we were talking about a project. Maybe you are talking about this uh, ecolo uh, theoretical ecological project. Uh, and I, I, I have to uh, thank to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, to, to Geza to invite me to this uh, uh, series of uh, 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 lectures because I am a, a practitioner. Uh, so I, I'm not, uh, I want to know some more about the theory, but uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately. Well, uh, this is the case. Actually, I am uh, working in the Danube Delta and uh, you know, specializing in amphibians and reptiles. And uh, I am uh, responsible for uh, national reports to the European Commission on the status of the species. And I, uh, I have seen some, some of uh, these kind of lectures. And when uh, Matthew has mentioned that uh, <laughs> They need some, uh, or he needs some real systems where uh, they have to experiment the theories. I was thinking that listening uh, at these uh, uh, presentations, uh, I, I, I can feel the huge gap between the, the theory and the practice. Uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, if you, uh, well, uh, if if you want to field tests, the, uh, that there are a lot of them. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I well, we have tried uh, just an example uh, about the theory and practice. We are working on making um, official well, reports on the status of species and uh, habitats, where practical habitat types uh, in, in uh, the frame of Natura 2000 uh, system, uh, network on country level. Uh, well, uh, uh, I am the author of the, of the chapters on uh, amphibians and reptiles, and, uh, but, but I know the colleagues uh, who are dealing with other species and with the habitat types, and I know that, uh, well, uh, well, uh, how, how to say it, uh, uh, that there is nothing to do with the theory when, when you have to report on, on country level or not to mention on continental level at the, uh, uh, at the European Commission. So uh, what, what I, uh, well, it will be nice if uh, maybe we will get somehow uh, uh, well, a possibility to, to check out all, all, all these uh, theories in, in, in concrete um, sites or places. Because, uh, you know, maybe we have several, we had and we have several projects in, in uh, so-called ecosystem-based management. Uh, I, I, some, somehow I try to link theory to the practice. Uh, uh, fortunately, well, uh, the theory is very nice. Uh, even this ecosystem-based management uh, theories, but they, they are not really working. So uh, I, I am a practitioner, so I, I can see every, every day. And, and so, somebody mentioned disappearing species. Uh, that are not uh, taken into account in the, I don't know what kind of formulas. Uh, 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 yes, yes, the, 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 that's, a, uh, that's a practical problem. So, so yeah, okay, uh, I, I have seen uh, 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 
uh, I don't know, I just hypothesis, but uh, uh, is there any, any chance uh, to, to link somehow to the practice this? Oh, or not, not really. Well, or, or it will be some separate uh, issues. I think possibly the parts where we really know how to link theory to practice are the bits of theory that we've had for the longest. The things like, for example, um, say um, Hutchinson's axioms, um, which do lead us directly to the simplest kinds of models that we think are plausible. Um, and I think perhaps it's not a coincidence that um, the bits of theory that have been around for the longest are the ones that, that see the most application because they're the things that we understand the best. So, you know, optimistically, I might argue that um, the, the bits of theory that are around now that we don't really understand yet maybe the bits that in another 50 years or so we might know how to do. But yeah, I think definitely I would be, if I'm looking at applying something to management, I would typically be looking back at theory that has been around for at least a couple of decades rather than theory that we're only doing now. Uh, the, the problem is not necessarily only the uh, certain site related management, uh, but uh, in some cases maybe we. Well, well I know by uh, by uh, some personal experience, you can influence even uh, national or European policy. Oh, okay, now Great Britain is not uh, part of the European Union, but I, I mean. Uh, <laughs> Uh, general continental level, uh, you, you can influence uh, the policy. Uh, but uh, if there is a gap between, uh, you know, uh, one is the, the theory we, we learn in the uh, high school, in university, and uh, post, I don't know, in other PhD courses. And one is in practice, and totally other is on in in, in the reality uh, uh, the uh, enforcement of of some some theoretical rules. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I I don't know how, how it can be. Uh, oh, okay, I am not accustomed with the theoretical uh, ecological issues, so so that is why I was just. Uh, uh, curious to, to what are you talking about here uh, and uh, uh, I was thinking that maybe maybe some somehow that there is probably a link but maybe I, I cannot uh, <laughs> see it uh, between the theory and the, and, uh, and the practice okay uh, I, I don't uh, say that uh, every uh, formula every I don't know theory hypothesis it has a uh, immediate application in practice, practice, but there is a, 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 a very huge distance between the managers of, of the nature protections uh, or nature conservation issues and the, and the, uh, the, the um, people who are really de uh, dealing with the theoretical aspects. Probably uh, all, both of them are all right, but uh, they they. Do not really know uh, uh, about each other's work. Or, or, so, so, there, there is a problem. Uh, I am a biologist, and uh, I am uh, uh, actually moving between politicians and uh, uh, well, uh, managers. Uh, and and uh, now, now with, uh, with, with with these theories, uh, I, I cannot. Well, okay. Well, can I just can I, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Is, is it okay if I say something? Yes. So maybe if I don't know what Geza asked you to attend particularly this talk or just talks in general in this series, you have been maybe unfortunate to pick the most theoretical, most <laughs> abstract, and most mathematical talk of all the ones we did. 
And um, yes, yeah, so. that, so yes, let me give you one one example from, of the result that, that I believe um, is this purely theoretical result, and it's extremely helpful for for the kind of work you're doing. Um, there's lots of there many um, uh, conservation ecologists believe that if they see a change in the community local species composition of an of a of a uh, community that shows that something has changed and maybe something has changed for the worse. And, and one of the things that we found is that, no, that's not true. You actually, in natural communities, you naturally find this change and it shows you that everything is fine. And if you stop seeing the change, then you have a problem. That's one of the, the, the one, one possible result that, that may, be, may be useful for your, for your work, which, which comes out of, of uh, deep theoretical thinking. And maybe just one other comment on that. I think that perhaps um, the link between theory and management is a fair bit stronger in North America and Australia than it is in Europe and the UK. Um, I think that's partly historical accident, um, but I often find that when I'm looking for papers that apply ecological theory to management, they're often coming from North America and Australia. Excel, I think next week I will come to Budapest best case of why he recommended uh, okay. uh, this lecture. So, but uh, yeah, yeah, generally he invited me to, to be thought. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I send out uh, this uh, uh, invitation lec uh, lecture to all Hungarian ecologists, so uh, I don't uh, 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 discriminate between theoretical and empirical researchers, and that's all. Uh, thank you all. Uh, are there any final questions? If not, then thank you so much again, uh, Matthew, and thank you everybody else for uh, being here. Where's Ned? Maybe he had to leave in the meantime. Uh, but thanks to him as well. Uh, as usual, in two weeks' time, we're going to have the next uh, session. So we hope to see you all there. So until then, uh, take care and see you then. Bye, everyone. Bye.